All right, well, welcome to today's lecture. Um, I'm Corey Beeg. I'm the Program Director of Architecture and an Associate Professor here at UT. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecturer, Dora Epstein-Jones. Dora is a theorist and teacher of architectural culture. Her work focuses on the discipline of architecture and includes interrogations of the discipline's boundaries and operations through examinations of tectonics, practice, and pedagogy, as well as concerns such as gender, sex, mobility, and criticality. We are very fortunate to have had Dora join our faculty as professor of practice this year, teaching courses that encapsulate the breadth of knowledge and expertise that is Dora, including classes ranging from theories of tectonics to the history of prefabrication and architectural theory, and the emergence of fab labs to the publication of publications and jump-starting of issue, and all that within her first year. Um, this breadth comes not only in her course titles, but also in the wonderfully original titles of her written work. Here are just a few samples. The Mouth and the Gullet, Loose Modularity, Lumpy Logic, Abject Terror, A Story of Fear, Sex, and Architecture, and Extreme Makeover, or How the F Word Shaped Contemporary Architecture. As a colleague, it becomes clear that there are two reasons you call Dora, to write a chapter for your book when your book is missing that thing, or to connect the dots in a way that someone hasn't connected them before. Her work is uniquely tuned to matters of design and the way design can exert its influence. It has been published in compilations as wide ranging as possible mediums, a book that includes a collection of design mediums and a projection of architecture and knowledge to come. Um, speculative Coolness, Architecture, Media, the Real and the Virtual, a book about speculative coolness, and the forthcoming Purple Architecture, as well as several essays for the very important journal of our time, Log. And although her CD is one, CV is one of multidisciplinarity, after all, she holds a PhD in architectural history, theory, and criticism from UCLA, an MA in urban planning from UCLA, and a BS in applied behavioral sciences from UC Davis, it's also rooted in buildings and the building of buildings. Dora has co-authored and or edited books focused squarely on practice, including Zago Architecture and Office Da, two installations, and her latest work, which is centered around collections for Morphosis and Stray Dog Cafe, including the recently published book Morphosis Model Monograph. She served as a principal with Jones Partners Architecture with Wes Jones and has been involved with the design of several speculative and built projects and has been a frequent sounding board for some of the world's most well-known designers. That small sample of just a few of the things Dora has been up to represents the kind of expansiveness that she is known for and why she is such a valuable member of our school and more broadly, the whole of the discipline. She has unique ability to rope in the current of our time, the canon of the discourse, and the issues local to whatever region of the world she finds herself in. While acting as chair of the architecture department at Texas Tech, she advocated for the importance of the rural. While coordinator of both general studies and history theory at SciArc, she did the same for the urban. I, for one, am excited for the deep knowledge of our field that Dora brings to our school, our courses, and our conversations. Please join me in welcoming Dora Epstein-Jones. Wow, can you hear me? Yeah, all good? Yeah, thank you, Corey, for that wonderful um, introduction. Um, and, and, and thank you, Clay, and the lecture committee for inviting me and to various uh, deans as they come in and out. And um, as a, a really special bit of love for the UT Austin faculty who've taken me in when uh, me and, and really my family needed it most. Um, I'm grateful. And I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you, so I hope that today can serve as a conversation starter. If you don't get enough of me today, I think I'm also going to be talking a lot on, 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 on Friday. So then you'll have too much of me and, uh, and we'll all be uh, sated. Um, so today I'm going to take you through a brief of my present work. Um, which is a book for the um, writing architecture series published by uh, MIT Press. Um, this work gets a little bit philosoph philosophical, it gets a little bit in the weeds, and so for your convenience, um, just for today's lecture, I've organized this into what I'm calling orientations, arguments, and agencies. So orientations is a little bit about me. I'm a theorist. I study the discipline of architecture. 
I'm obsessed with super nerdy details and I direct a lot of my inquiry toward the dominant narratives that have comprised and produced this discipline we call architecture. And while I get it that, you know, disciplines are constructed as both power and episteme, I also see the extent to which we're stuck in a discipline. I mean, as long as we have institutions and museums and education and audiences and clients and labor and logistics and codes and licensing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we have a discipline. So my fundamental question has been, why punish? Why so bad? Is there anything positive that can be gained from a discipline? And if so, how? So at the core of my work is this positive valence. I was at UCLA in the 1990s, which was kind of the West Coast birth center of the digital age. And really the broad agreement or kind of caveat there was that evolutionary computing was going to kind of eliminate the need for history and theory in architecture. History and theory were over. And you can imagine my dismay. I had come from urban planning and I'd been closely aligned working with um, uh, Jackie Levitt and with Ed Soja. And I really felt welcome there as a, at that time, gender and sexuality theorist. And so here I came into architecture and it's like, no, theory's over. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's funny because I think in the last years since my career has spanned um, that a lot of my architecture colleagues confuse my positive vibes for being post-critical. Um, but I, I suppose that what I'd like to say is I'm lucky to have had a strong foundation in feminist, queer, and othering discourses such as bell hooks, my my, my, my favorite, and Trinity Minha and Adrian Rich and Liz Gross, who all confirmed for me that I can be critical and loving, that I can be angry and celebratory, that I don't need to stay small or domestic or local, and that I can voice big theoretical thoughts. And a side note on that is beware of anyone telling you that eh is over. <laughs> That's a sure sign that the gates are being kept. So as a theorist, I conduct historical research and I write, but I also convene and converse as in this, uh, chat, this uh, issue of log that I did with uh, Brian E. Roberts that, uh, uh, that really became um, sort of weirdly, wildly popular with a life of its own and I think it's on doing off beautiful things. Um, a dear non-architecture friend read my essays and including this essay and, and he asked me, he's like, are you the policeman or the criminal? And I, I thought that was pretty cool. But, but mostly, I've dedicated my career to one good message. The discipline of architecture, our discipline, that which includes a lot of landscape architecture, interior design, and urban design, is more elastic, more generous than we give it credit for. Now, I came to this conclusion during my doctoral work on travel trailers and mobile homes, which were emphatically declared not architecture by my committee. At that time, I answered my committee's objections by referring to the discipline as possessing a kind of agility. But honestly, I believe now that the discipline is less self-conscious and canny than that. It's not as intelligent as that, perhaps. Foucault once said that power quilts itself to points of resistance. And Liz Gross countered that by saying, wow, there must be thousands of moving points of resistance. So if the idea of a kind of soft or generous discipline just isn't working for you, at least imagine a dynamic, mobile, multifarious discipline with edges and raggedy, permeable edges and 
movement. So currently, the conditions of the discipline that are interesting me now are the ones where the discipline converges with modernity in like the seemingly most hardcore absolutist ways. The work of say creating an ontology or policing an ontology. You see, in the most ideal version of modernity, or at least the narrative that Western European modernity has presented to itself about itself, how convenient, <laughs> ontologies are understood as binding contracts, usually contracts based on exploitation and otherness, but they're strict and they're punitive. However, because the technical and the social often overlap, that contract is co-constructed with practices. And practices, yeah, they slip. They slip and they slip. And I search for these slippages. I particularly look for them in architectural acts, drawing and in design and in design practices. So to the book portion of this. Pre-pandemic, I was in, in the Avery Special Collections at, at, at Columbia. And I was calling up basically every shred of documentation cataloged under the words architectural theory. And these were like 99% drawings, these folios, kind of big folio things. And like a lot of trained doctoral students, former doctoral students, I was looking for a particular needle in a haystack. And my haystack, which was this pile, this kind of growing pile of the rejected folios, um, was growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, I started to feel really bad for the librarians and for the people who manage the stacks. And I thought, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. And, you know, and just let, let these poor people be. And um, so without my kind of needle, um, I, I, without finding my needle, I left. I hit the subway, I transferred to the N, and uh, revelation. My needle was the haystack, this giant pile of folios, all of these persnickety classicist drawing columns, arguing about the orders, arguing about heiresses and fussing over metopes. And even as architecture had become, you know, and the Avery collection is a lot of 19th century stuff. So even as architecture is becoming modern and the fact of steel and glass and concrete, and they're still like fussing, fussing, fussing over the, 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 the abacus and the size of the capital and, and the echinus and, uh, and, and so forth. And these were all these drawings. And these drawings were practices. And these practices were not just working to solidify the discipline, compressing it down into this kind of super, whoops, sorry, I have a super fine, you know, sort of organism. But they were also arguing with each other. They were, they were also really engaged in these debates with each other. And so my current work is on this big kahuna of a really thin bandwidth of 400 plus years of architectural theory, the orders. And while the book that I'm working on encompasses a lot of hair splitting versions and, and, and the haystack, yes, there are a lot, I'll just excerpt this part for today. This little morsel I'll discuss has to do with how architectural knowledge is not universal and true, but guided by custom. And I, this might feel a little bit duh to us, but in the 17th century, it wasn't so duh. And this little part comes from a pretty strange place, which is smack dab in this super consolidation of the discipline in the academy. So I was familiar at, at this point with both Christopher Height's argument and Lucia Ale's discussion um, uh, regarding um, this particular image from Claude Perrault's Ordonnance of 1680. And, and both of my colleagues and 
idols, uh, especially uh, Lu Lucia, um, uh, refer um, to this image as a kind of modern moment. For Chris Height, it's the presence of the grid that serves as the regulating system for the orders. And for uh, Ale, it's this way in which Perot had kind of presciently di uh, discovered a distinction of kind rather than of part, which was how most of classicist thinking was. And Ale said something in, in this 2005 article about it that just triggered me. She said, Perot's system tolerates inaccuracy. So, of course, I wanted to unpack that assertion a bit more. You see, we generally look at this moment with Perot as a kind of outlier moment that architectural theory has a history of the establishment of the orders, and unlike his colleagues, notably Blondel, or like everyone else at the Academy at that time, Perot was kind of leaning into the possibility that the order of the orders was not universally and always correct. Perot had been uh, tasked to translate Vitruvius. Um, and he had been tasked on behalf of a kind of identify, identification of the new French nation or the French national order. So this was already a political act. And he was plagued by the idea that so-called you know, cultural blossoming wasn't limited to Rome. And he was especially kind of haunted by the presence of influential Italian architects such as Palladio and Serlio. And so, as we know pretty well, and you've probably been taught this in, in architectural history classes, um, Perot distinguishes. He distinguishes between two types of beauty. Uh, and the absolute type of beauty, which is derived from nature and associated with these kind of universal laws, and then what he interchangeably calls both arbitrary and customary forms of beauty. So there's kind of an absolute, and then there's an arbitrary customary um, uh, one. And as you, as you probably know, this opinion or this sort of interpretation by Perot is it totally scandalous. It's querel-inducing, quarrel-inducing. But Perot insisted that much of what we understand of beauty in architecture wasn't due to reasonable or logical or lawful sets of, say, harmonic parts, but rather, and this is a really striking moment, a kind of perceptual social consensus, the arbitrary or the customary. Now, there's been plenty of ink spilled on absolute versus arbitrary beauty, but like others, I was attracted to Perot's kind of looseness with the rules and how he was so emboldened to do this in the 17th century. Antoine Picon chalks it up to Perot's, he calls, creative agency. And Ale says, well, you know, he was modern before modern was cool. But as we say in Texas, all right, all right, all right. Here's the lingering question. Is that just Perot's system? As Ale suggests, is Perot a solitary genius acting alone? Or are Perot's conclusions the revelatory symptom of a much larger, much, much larger epistemic movement, the kind of movement that might cause what this thing we call architectural knowledge to shift. And I contend the latter. Perot was in a smushy era. Western European modernity was out in the ocean discovering and exploiting and constructing itself doing a lot of exploiting to construct itself, constructing the nation that it calls France, and Perot was seizing on the uncertainty. 
A few years previously, and, and as a demonstration of this, a few years previously, 20 years previously, uh, Roland Fréard de Chambray had published this comparison of 10 different theories of the five orders of architecture. Now, Fréard absolutely committed to what he called correct and incorrect classical proportions, and so he drew these parallels. And um, he compares in each of these different architects' versions of different orders. So if you look, there's that, you know, Serralio is, is, is up against Vignola. Uh, Delorme, who he just savages, uh, is, uh, uh, is up against Barbaro, right? You can, you can see these, uh, these, these comparisons. And um, he's really, uh, Freyart's very bold in, say, in stating which architects were just imitating Palladio, who was kind of cheating. And, you know, uh, I mean, he says of Delorme, he's like, Delorme learns everything he can going to Rome, except he sees it through Gothic eyes, right? Which is burn central in, uh, in, in, in that time. And, um, so Freyart has these kind of celebrity death matches, and he's being very, very clear, but he, he's opening the door here, the theoretical door, to really a multiplicity of discrepancies, right? A lot of dis sets of disagreements over uh, uh, the exactitude uh, supposing exactitude of these orders. I mean, they're called the orders. They're supposed to be orderly. Um, and that, that multiplicity of discrepancies, you know, Perot, he probably really didn't believe that there were only two forms of beauty. Um, Alberto Perez Gomez's translations of Perot allow us to see Perot kind of struggling with a larger concept of truth, both in the essays on physics that he wrote with the older brother Nicholas, not, not Charles, those are more fun, um, and, uh, in, and in the Ordnance. And so these are quoted here uh, uh, with Nicholas, truth is but the totality of the phenomena. Um, we can give multiple explanations without ever expecting to find one that is exclusively true. And um, then in the ordinance, um, this, this, uh, it is impossible to find any source other than custom for the pleasure that they impart. I mean, so for as much as he says that, there, that there's a, a universal positive beauty, he's like, eh, re there's no real source other than, um, than, than custom. And I think Perot so, so, so doesn't believe in absolute truth that his answer to the abuses and licenses with the orders is he actually, he just takes them all. And here you can see when I say all, sometimes they're uh, uh, examples that are archeological examples, but sometimes they're from other architects, Palladio, Vignola, say. He takes them all and he just kind of averages them out mathematically. So no matter from whence in history they originated or with whom, Perot measures reports and then kind of subsumes this into what he calls our dimensions, our dimensions, by which uh, I assume he means the French national uh, dimensions. But the French national dimensions then are, are not true, they're an average, which is, as you all know, an elision of, uh, of, of truth. But it also, you know, I can see why this ordinance gets a really chilly reception from the dear Sun King, who probably really objected to being average in the search for a French uh, um, identity of beauty. So it's around the same time that Perrault was writing um, uh, Gian Battista Vico was born, and by 1725 we have a convergence because Perot's texts come into common printing, and uh, the latest Louis, not the Sun King, he packs everybody up and he moves to Versailles. We so kind of abandons the, the 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 project in many ways, and um, and Vico um, pens this the new science, and according to Vico the the new science, which is basically all of humanistic knowledge at that point, was and is constructed, made, invented by man, by history. 
And so it's not some universal law waiting to be discovered. We see here his frontispiece that he, he commissioned and approved where uh, Homer and metaphysics are kind of bouncing ideas off of the big eye in the sky and then it's coming back and civilizations are toppling and growing and this is supposed to be just this big counter to Descartes and to Cartesian acts of observing truth and distilling universal principles through mathematic exactitude. And Vico says, okay, okay, there might be some universal truths, what he called il, il vero, but most humans operate at a level of mm, more like certainty, derived from judgment that is uh, learned over time, and that's il cero. Now, I'm no Vician scholar, but I think you could describe Vico then as this kind of really early, early, early structuralist, and um, that he thinks that idea, you know, that, that knowledge is based on sort of this history of ideas. But the word that Vico uses in order to describe that is custom. Custom. Custom is also the word that gets used by Piranesi in his observations on the letter of Monsieur Mariette. He states point blank that it's custom which fixes the rule, not Vitruvius, not Palladio. And he proclaims, he says, the order should be abolished, the whole system should be abolished, and that their elements can now be used with liberty. He uses, the, he's kind of excited about this. If you haven't read the observations of the letter of Monsieur Mar Mariette, you should. It's, 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 quite, it's quite the read. Um, so this is at a time when Western culture is out really trying to catalog all of the parts. And it's really leaning toward a narrative that's going to say, oh, the Greeks were the superior version, that that was the, 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 the end all of, uh, of that. And Pyrenees, here's Piranesi, and he's unearthing all of these Etruscan examples. He's putting them up against really the, the Julian David Leroy, who, who is really the, the, the master of this Greek uh, narrative, and he's calling out his colleagues, and he says, quote, you know, you are all following custom. And he says, it's folly, and it's monotonous, and it's probably wrong. He says monotonous, you can again read this. So back to Perot and the Carrel and this stunning comparative slide that gets used in every architectural history class in the Western Hemisphere. And I was like, wait, why was there no permanent revolution at that time? Why didn't the sum totality of Perot and Vico and Louis going to Versailles and all that give way to a more flexible narrative or a more flexible set of architectural epistemologies? And the answer, I think, I theorize, is this. The system doesn't tolerate inaccuracies. Inaccuracy tolerates a system, for a while, anyway. And every system tolerated is based on custom, a kind of consensus. And that the word we use now to denote custom meaning judgment based on fairly loose evidence or non-evidence is bias. I mean, I often wonder how the world would appear to us if Perot had won the Carrel, and that this hut, this hyper-local, contextual, relational hut, had formed the basis of architectural knowledge then. Or, if Le Corbusier's eyes which do not see opened up a new order, an order based on cars, on mobility, on shaping, on performance, on skins, instead of remaining with the temple, still teaching the temple, even today. Or if we had imagined a non-sexist city, So at this point, 
I'm going to end a little bit the book portion and kind of move into what I call maybe more active architectural urgency. So the, 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 so what do we do with this? What, you know, I mean, that, that's nice, Dora. That sounds really cool for those 17th century white men. Um, uh, but what, what do we do? So following the understanding of maybe the orders as as directed by custom or architectural knowledge as being directed by, by custom. And uh, the deviations in those orders or, or knowledges or epistemes can be uh, made through creative agency, through license, and, and that's the other parts of, of this book. Um, I, I'm going to return to the underlying kind of non-truth at the heart of the work, and that is there is no fundamental order to the universe, only disorder. Order is a concretization, and it's temporary. As Bruno Latour says, the world is not a solid continent of facts sprinkled by a few lakes of uncertainties, but a vast ocean of uncertainties speckled by a few islands of calibrated and stabilized, usually stabilized for a short, pretty short duration of forms. And so it's likely that we're wrong most of the time, like almost all of the time, like amazingly wrong, like the Earth is flat, or the sun revolves around the Earth, or Pluto is a planet, or electricity is bad, or cars are good, or sugar won't kill you, or sea sweetener won't kill you. We're wrong, wrong, wrong all the time. On and on and on. And so when I read the 18th century arguments and drawings on the orders, what I see is not just that tiny bandwidth, but this long-term set of practices revealing customs and bias, the adherences to customs and bias. Now, bias and custom are useful. They're really useful in a world that's primarily disorderly. We say, okay, yeah, that, we're going to call that thing a chair. We're going to call this thing, you know, a, 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 a table. Yeah, we're, we're, we're good. We're going to go ahead and go with the consensus on that. And we exchange information this way. We can organize institutions and lecture series, and we can uphold a discipline. We can transmit that discipline as knowledge and have students and, uh, and, and teaching and so forth. Bias and custom are also super helpful in making a generous discipline. And any map of architectural thinking from the 18th century moment onwards was going to reveal a lot of turbulencies within that discipline within that discipline, many challenges, much questioning. But custom and bias are also dangerous, harmful, especially if they cease to have relevance, or if they exploit, or if they lead to design decisions and practices that are wasteful, capricious, unjust, racist, sexist, or just plain smack of privilege. So the good news is that custom and bias, which is also this fundamental state of admitting we're usually wrong, means that change can also occur. My favorite contemporary author on the subject of bias is Jennifer Eberhardt. Dr. Eberhardt conducts one-to-one -one experiments using face priming and what she calls then shape prejudice. For example, this grainy gun shape is slowly revealed from frame one, which is kind of super unclear, to frame 50, which is a kind of absolute clarity of, of that image. And she shows a subject participant, a white person's face, and it takes about 41 frames to recognize the gun. But when she face primes a black face, her subject participants recognize the gun in only 20 frames. And she also looks at things like baseball calls and you know umpire calls and the, and the instantaneousness of these stereotypes and that these stereotypes alter how we perceive objects and how we perceive shapes. 
Now, obviously, her experiments are associative and help us understand how racism can be so persistent, pervasive, and terribly violent. But her experiments also show us how instantaneous these cognitive links can occur with custom and bias. She shows how bias can feel natural, how it can be really stubbornly embedded. And that feeling of attachment, of you know, comfort and discomfort is, according to Eberhardt, a feature of bias itself. Now I'm gonna embarrass maybe uh, a, a member of our audience. Closer to home, I also very much respect these recent chronograms, diagrams um, offered by Charles Davis, Dr. Davis, and, and, and Curry Hackett. Um, I'd love to see this diagram extended into the late 17th and 18th centuries, as I strongly suspect that the more conservative and unrelenting tectonic theories on the column orders were probably informed by a uh, you know, racialized uh, worldview, and certainly one that idealized uh, uh, Greek forms. I also think it, it is connected to this uh, a sense of a French national identity. Um, but more on the track of the orders and what I'm, I'm, I'm working on, the, these authors, both Eberhardt and, and, and Davis' work, shows that just because tectonic associations and shape cognitions can be instantaneous in our brains or thoroughly lodged into our historiographies, does not and should not infer that these conditions, tectonic conditions, are neutral or value-free. If anything, tectonic theories seem the most charged of our architectural discourses, and in many ways still the most hidden, or even in the case of these uh, historiographies, the ones most actively repressed under a mask of seeming neutrality. Now consider the evidence that Perez Gomez offers to explain Perot's adherence to customary beauty. He says, well, you know, he, he, he was involved in a kind of culture of visual correction. And visual correction, I read, is really a kind of tectonic comfort. If the triglyph doesn't appear to be supported by the corner column, then the temple appears unstable. If the column doesn't use an entesis, it will appear wan or, 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 or thin. And so these corrections, these visual corrections that then get put into these drawings are ones that are meant to alleviate those senses of discomfort. Moving into a contemporary era, how else should we explain the continued use of crown moldings and baseboards and window frames and as anything but the privileged desire for tectonic comfort? All this banding, tectonic comfort. <laughs> yes, we can attribute some choices to style, but we must acknowledge a popular abhorrence of an unframed window or an uncladded facade or an unparapeted roof. Please stop and think for just a casual second of how many miles and miles of wood or whatever this adhesive stuff that you can buy on Wish uh, is used to satisfy our cravings for moldings or how much we material we use for fascia or soffits. And tectonic comfort is not only aesthetic, what we might call a kind of beauty bias. Tectonic comfort is the direct lineage of these tectonic customs. The persistent strain of classicism, Blondel one, that makes us seek in the wall what Western European architects thought they saw in the orders, a top, a middle, and a base. A sturdy base to assure us of a stable footing, a graduated pedestal to gently rise vertically, a vertical rise that's not too long, not too vertiginous, and of course, a cusp, a lip, a shoulder, to connect that vertical element as if to visually hold up the ceiling, the beam, the roof on top of it.
Indeed, there are plenty of perceptual studies to this effect from the tectonic projections that Arnheim described where we're supposed to be projecting our bodies onto these tectonic uh, uh, customs. Um, let, you know, the capital is the head and, and, and the base is the foot, and, and which is really ableist. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, but uh, not sorry. Um, uh, to these aforementioned studies of, of tectonic uh, form. Um, to these kind of quasi-scientific or even outright scientific surveys like this one on Finnish log architecture. In this study, the authors, they were very careful to state that the contemporary log projects, these Finnish log, log projects, referred to glue lamb logs, not like whole logs harvested. And they, uh, uh, which is the industry standard in, uh, in, in Finland, and for the sake of uh, forestation, um, the policy mandates the use of these glue lamb logs. And so the architects that participated in the survey were shown all of these uh, uh, log, contemporary log architecture examples. And the architects, of course, very reasonable, very well educated, and, you know, and so forth. But they all clung to this notion of a truth to materials. They all preferred the upper example to the lower because they were concerned that the lower didn't, quote, look like logs. Additionally, they were dismayed by the presence of what they discern as a kind of steel structure underneath the logs because, and then according to one architect, strong logs don't need steel. So, Although we have plenty of building science devoted to reducing material waste and to furthering best construction practices, I see undoing unlearning tectonic comfort as our next ask of a generous discipline, our next necessary request. And this is not only to unlearn bias because unlearning bias is the right thing to do. Our planet is on fire. People are being swept away. Animal species are dying off. And while I can be a little cheeky here, I really do want to ask in utter earnestness, can we please enter and begin to even enjoy the smushiness of this architectural discipline in order to confront these tectonic customs, especially if it means or could mean making race present, acting with environmental justice, or maybe, just maybe, mitigating climate disaster. Academies and research units are brimming with good intelligent innovation, sound modes of construction and structure that use thermoresponsive concrete, reusable materials, additive and subtractive processes, celluloid fibers, liquids and mushrooms. And with these advances come new shape, to shape tectonics and maybe new orders of columns that are necessary to support play, water flow, plant life, as well as support a very human need for ornamentation, expression, and intricacy. We see plenty of design experimentation with non-humans and planetary awareness, but just as custom and bias can keep sweeping racial epistemologies below decks, we can't keep surrendering, and we certainly can't keep surrendering tectonics because no matter how innocuous, neutral, or naturalized, or no matter how historicized and nostalgic and symbolic, clinging to tectonic custom is power-laden and privileged. We are here. We are 3D printing. We're using AI. We have robots. We have scripting. We have all kinds of CAD. Um, we do not all descend from grand Western narratives. We do not need to hew toward a Western European canon. And so if all of those floofy 17th century theorists could make space for challenging custom, then I think we too can plunge right into uncertainty and discomfort. And I really think that for any hope of a future, we should. Thank you.